Hi everyone, on behalf of IUG, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, System Manager Advanced Management User Tips presented by Avaya. Thank you for participating in today's webinar and for your continued support in this IUG webinar program. Before we begin, I have three quick housekeeping items to go over. First, today's webinar will be recorded and available for on-demand viewing. Second, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. All your questions will need to be entered in the question window near the bottom of your GoToWebinar screen. Third, there will be a short evaluation that pops up as you exit the webinar. Please make sure to take a minute and let us know what you thought of today's session and what you might like to see going forward. Let's get started. I would now like to turn things over to Dennis Sanger, an Avaya System Manager expert. Hi, this is Dennis Sanger. Um, I've been a software developer with Avaya for 35 years now, um, going all the way back to when we were part of at and Bell Labs, then Lucent, then now Avaya. I've worked on various products like uh, System 85 and Communication Manager, and now for the past 12 years, since day one, basically, um, I've been developing software for Session Manager. So today's topic is uh, how to configure Session Manager call routing uh, using the forms on System Manager. It's a very broad topic. We're going to hit a lot of different uh, different forms. Um, unfortunately, because of time constraints, we're not going to be able to go into great depth on any of them. The idea here is to give you a sense of what's possible. And uh, if you see something that you hadn't seen before and you're interested in, uh, you can go research that on your own. Um, we're going to go from very simple to very complex uh, pretty quickly. Uh, if you do have questions, I'm going to try and leave time for Q&A at the end. Uh, if we don't get to your question, we'll provide a written answer to your question that will be distributed to all the attendees. So let's dive in. Uh, so these are the topics we're going to hit. Um, routing using digits and domains, that would be the, the simple part how you set up dial patterns, routing policies, time of day routing. Uh, then we're going to connect that with locations and a fairly new feature, origination dial pattern set. Um, tie all of those into you know, mapping to SIP entities and entity links. Um, SIP entities have addresses. Those addresses can be resolved using DNS and local host name resolution. Uh, how do you set up alternate routing? There are two kinds of alternate routing. We'll get into that. And then we're going to hit the more complex topics like regular expression routing, uh, adaptation, both digit adaptation and regular expression adaptation. And then in the end, uh, I'll give you a look at a couple of um, troubleshooting tools you can use. Uh, we're going to be going through this with screenshots from System Manager. It's a, a, an 813 System Manager. may look a little different than what you're used to. Um, if if I need to, I do have a, a live system manager available, but I'd, uh, I'm hoping I can stick to the screenshots just to move things along. So let's dive in here. Uh, routing using digits and domains this is pretty much the simplest kind of routing you can do. SIP calls are routed based on URIs, uniform resource identifiers, and they take the form of SIP colon user at host, where user is typically a digit string you can route on alphanumeric strings. I'll show you how to do that. And host is going to be a domain. It can be an IP address, but generally it's going to be a domain like avaya.com. Uh, you administer the domains that your session manager is going to be authoritative for, um, that is that your session manager is going to do routing for, on the domain management form. Um, it's common for, you, for a customer to have just one domain and to never route to any other domain. Uh, if you do receive a SIP invite for a domain that your session manager is not authoritative for, that's going to route by doing DNS resolution on that domain. Uh, that's not a very common scenario, though. At the bottom, we've got a screenshot uh, from my lab. Uh, so I do have several domains here, just because I do a lot of uh, a lot of experimentation in the lab. But again, it would be perfectly common for you to just have the one domain and never route on any other domain. Uh, once you've got your domain set up, then uh, you can set up your dial patterns. And uh, it's really just a bunch of digit strings uh, of the form 
leading digits, minimum and maximum number of digits. And uh, then you can map that to uh, one or more routing policies. Uh, you can restrict dial patterns to specific domains if you have multiple domains you're routing for. Um, or, uh, or you can have dial patterns applied to all domains that your SM is authoritative for. You can restrict dial patterns to specific locations or all locations. Uh, you can also restrict dial patterns to origination dial pattern sets, and we'll get into that a little more later. Um, dial patterns can be ranges. Um, so typically, you would specify the leading digits and then the minimum and maximum number of digits. If you prefer, you can specify a range. So from this number to that number, uh, separated by a colon. We've got an example of that. Uh, so that would be an example right there. So that's 56000 through 56999. Kind of a silly example. I could have done that one with just the leading digits 56. Um, it's just an example. Dial patterns can also use X as a wild card. I've got an example of that here. So 58XX2, where the X stands for any digit. So this would match, for example, 58122. It would match 58342. Uh, you you get the idea. So um, dial patterns mapping to routing policies. A dial pattern can have multiple routing policies, and you can have just one routing policy, that's fine, or you can have multiple routing policies corresponding to multiple destination SIP entities. Those are gonna be tried in rank order from numerically lowest to numerically highest. And each routing policy can have a different rank at different times of the week. That's how we implement time of day routing, and you'll you'll see an example of that coming up. This is what the dial pattern form looks like for an, an uh, individual dial pattern. So we've got the leading digits, the minimum, the maximum. Uh, the SIP domain in this particular example, um, this dial pattern applies to all domains. Or you can choose from the uh, drop down menu a specific domain. You're only going to see the domains that your session manager is authoritative for, so those domains that you put on the domain management form. And then uh, lower down, you can uh, specify an originating location and an originating dial pattern set that you want to restrict the routing policy to, and then add multiple routing policies. If you click on add, you'll uh, you'll see a different form where you can choose from all the available locations and all the available origination dial pattern sets. And then uh, there, there should be a drop down, I believe it is, for the routing policy you want that apply, to apply to. My example here, I've got two routing policies assigned. Both of them apply to all originating locations. Uh, I, I have not added an origination dial pattern set here. So two routing policies, the first one goes to the SIP entity SIP P2, the second one goes to the SIP entity SIP P3, and you see the rank column. Um, so my SIP P3 routing policy has rank 999, that's a pretty low rank. And uh, the other one has rank many, that means it's gonna have a different rank at different times of the week. So let's take a look at the routing policy and how you would implement time of day routing. Uh, this is the routing policy that has multiple ranks. Uh, you see that the SIP entity as destination is SIP P2. And uh, then down below, we've got time of day. Uh, so during business hours, this has rank one. Uh, that's that's gonna be a high rank. Um, so numerically, low ranks are high priority. Then uh, weekday evenings and weekday nights, it's got rank two, and on the weekend, it got, it's uh, got rank 100. Now, why would you want to do something like this? Uh, way back when carriers charged different rates at different times of the day, or, uh, or different rates on weekends, uh, you might have had multiple carriers, and you got a better deal from one than the other on the weekend, say. So during business hours, you'd want to route to one carrier. And on the weekends, you'd want to route to a different carrier. And this is how you would have accomplished that. Uh, that's not nearly as common anymore these days, but uh, you may still find some applications for time of day routing. Now, these times of day, um, how do you administer those? You go to the time ranges form. Um, 
and you can add uh, various time ranges here. You'll you'll get the 24/7 time range um, pre-populated as a default. Then you can add your own ranges. So for this example, I've added business hours Monday through Friday from nine to five. I've got weekday evenings Monday through Friday from five to midnight. Um, weekday nights would be Monday through Friday from midnight to nine. And then there's my weekend time range, uh, Saturday and Sunday, all day long. And, and of course, you can add whatever ranges you want here. And then uh, when you add the ranges to your routing policy, um, you have the opportunity to click on the View Gaps and Overlaps button there. And that'll tell you where, whether you fully covered the entire week or whether maybe you have uh, multiple ranges that overlap um, and cover the same time. Um, routing by location, you can essentially assign different dial plans by geographical location. And um, strictly speaking, it's not geographical location, it's IP based, but it generally maps pretty well to geography uh, for most enterprises. Um, an example of why you would want to route by location, a very common example, is dialing an emergency number from various locations. So if you have a New York and a Los Angeles location and a user in New York dials 911, uh, you don't want that emergency call going to the wrong location. You want it to uh, reach emergency services in the location that the caller is calling from. My example here is a, a little more elaborate than that. It's uh, admittedly a contrived example, but uh, what I've got here is uh, the dial pattern is 1303. So that's uh, Colorado's area code. That's where I'm located. Minimum and maximum of 11 digits, um, applying to all domains. Um, and we've got three locations here. Uh, if I'm calling from New York, I'm going to want to route this to an AT&T trunk. Uh, but if I'm calling from Thornton in Colorado, I want to route it to my local CM, which knows how to route local numbers. Uh, one more example down bottom, uh, I've got a location Los Angeles, uh, and I'm denying calls from the Los Angeles location because people from Los Angeles just shouldn't be allowed to call Colorado. Um, so how do you define locations? Uh, on the location form, uh, there are various details you can enter about locations, things like the amount of bandwidth available um, for call admission control, but that's not what this talk is concerned with. So how would you group um, users into a location, at the bottom of that form, there's a location pattern. And this is where you enter IP addresses that belong to that location. And there are various ways you can specify IP addresses. First of all, you can use IPv4 or IPv6. Uh, I can't say I see a lot of IPv6, but we certainly support it. Uh, you can enter just a long list of single IP addresses, but that would be a very tedious way to do this. So uh, we provide a few simpler capabilities than that. Uh, you can use wildcards, so you can use Xs, uh, and X stands for any digit. Uh, I don't think that's a very common way to enter IP addresses, though. More commonly, you would enter um, a subnet mask. So I've got an example of that here, 10.1.0.0 slash 16. So that would be um, 10.1. Uh, and anything following that. The last 16 bits uh, can be anything. Um, I mean, that's a, a common way to administer routers, for example, so that should be familiar to you. You can also enter IP address ranges. So um, in my example here, 10.2.10.0 through 10.2.12.255. So how is the location determined for a particular call? Uh, it depends on whether this is a call from an administered SIP user, so um, a SIP endpoint, either a hard phone or a soft phone, that's registered with your session manager. Uh, and there's a different location determination algorithm if the call is coming from, say, an H323 phone um, registered with your communication manager, or if it's coming from a, a trunk, a service provider. So for an administered SIP user, for a SIP endpoint, um, the highest priority is matching the IP address that the endpoint registered with against the IP addresses that you entered on the location form. Uh, 
if there's no location that matches the IP address of the phone, uh, then you use the location that's administered on the session manager profile form for that user. If you didn't specify a location there, then it's going to default to the location on the SIP entity form for the session manager that the endpoint is registered with. And we'll see the SIP entity form a little bit. Uh, if this is a non-SIP user, so an H323 phone or a trunk, a service provider, something like that, highest priority is the IP address um, in the SIP invite in the bottom most via header. If you're familiar with, with SIP messages, you'll know what I'm talking about. But this is a mechanism for figuring out where that invite request came from. Uh, so take that IP address, match it against all the locations. If you find a location that matches, there's your location. Otherwise, it's going to be the location that's administered on the SIP entity form for the SIP entity that the invite request came from. So the distinction here is uh, if you're talking about an H323 phone, for example, registered with a, a CM, um, that CM can serve multiple locations and uh, H323 phones can register from multiple locations. Session manager doesn't necessarily know where that phone is. Um, it knows the location of the CM, but it doesn't know the location of the phone. So it tries to determine the location of the phone by looking at the bottom most via header. If it can't do it that way, then it's just going to use the location of the CM. Um, we could probably talk for a whole hour about location determination, but those are the high points. Uh, here's a relatively new feature, origination dial pattern set. This came in in uh, 8.0.1. Um, we had some, some customers requesting this capability. And um, this basically lets you give a group of users their own private dial plan, um, even more specific than location or actually spanning locations. Uh, so you could imagine a particular department wants their own dial plan and uh, maybe that department's not the only one at that location, or maybe that department spans multiple locations, whatever. Um, you can lump users together and give them their own private dial plan using an origination dial pattern set. So you specify those users as dial patterns, uh, and these dial patterns are gonna get matched against the calling number in the invite request. Uh, my example here, this looks very much like a dial pattern. Uh, so you have leading digits, and then you have minimum and maximum. Um, I believe you can use ranges here as well. Uh, so my example, anything starting with 1303538 and totaling 11 digits is going to be part of this group. Um, uh, also, anything starting with 303538 totaling 10 digits. And uh, I've restricted it to avaya.com here as the domain. Um, so then on the uh, dial pattern itself, uh, where you would specify location, you also have the opportunity to specify that that dial pattern um, is going to apply to this particular set of users. Uh, so you've got a choice between location or origination dial pattern set. You can actually combine the two if you want. Okay, moving on to SIP entities now. Um, a SIP entity is pretty much anything that speaks SIP that isn't an individual endpoint, a hard phone or a soft phone. So for example, communication manager is a SIP entity. Uh, your service provider is a SIP entity. Session manager is also a SIP entity, but you can't route calls to session manager. Uh, you can route calls to endpoints that are registered with session manager, and that's outside the scope of what we're doing here. Um, you don't define dial patterns for endpoints, you define dial patterns for SIP entities. So um, you don't route calls to session managers as such, so you can't point a routing policy at a session manager. Uh, each SIP entity has an address, and there are multiple ways to specify that address. Uh, you can specify an FQDN, that's a fully qualified domain name, uh, or you can specify the address as an IPv4 address or an IPv6 address. A SIP entity can have both an IPv4 and an IPv6 uh, address. Uh, in addition to the address, um, you can specify the location on this form, and you're also going to add entity links on this form. Um, that FQDN, if you put an FQDN here, like, for example, uh, sessionmanager1.avaya.com, uh, 
Um, that's going to need to be resolved somehow, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes here. Um, entity links determine which uh, SIP entities your session manager can talk to. So if you don't have an entity link um, between the session manager and your SIP entity, you're not going to be able to route calls to it. Uh, each link has the session manager as SIP entity one. Uh, SIP entity two on the entity link can be either a session manager or it can be any other SIP entity. Uh, if you specify a session manager as, an enti as a SIP entity two, then um, those two session managers can pass um, SIP requests back and forth between each other. Now, why would you want to do that? Um, that's mainly for redundancy, but you can also use it to simplify your administration. Uh, the redundancy aspect, if I have two session managers, they both have um, entity links to my communication manager, then if session manager one can't reach the CM for some reason, it will send the invite request to session manager two, and session manager two will try to reach the CM. Now, admittedly, um, in modern networks, it's pretty unlikely that one session manager can reach the CM and the other one can't, but this provides you a little bit of extra redundancy just, because, uh, just in case you do have some very specific network problem. Now, the other uh, reason you, you could uh, assign entity links between your session managers is to simplify the administration. So you have, let's say, 10 session managers and one communication manager. And you don't necessarily want to enter entity links for all 10 of your session managers to talk to the communication manager. You could just enter um, one link from one session manager to that communication manager. And then all the other session managers are interlinked between each other. Uh, you've got entity links from every session manager to every other session manager. Uh, and uh, if one session manager wants to talk to the communication manager but doesn't have a direct link to it, it can go through the other session manager that does have the link. Now, for, um, for redundancy purposes, I really wouldn't recommend having just one link to the communication manager. You want at least two. And uh, honestly, I would recommend for, uh, for routing efficiency that you link all the session managers to that communication manager but you've got the option of doing it a different way. Uh, also on this entity link form, you've got um, protocol and port on both ends. So your choice of the protocol, uh, TCP, no security, uh, TLS, where you do have security. You've also got UDP, but that's, that's pretty uncommon. People prefer the reliability of TCP and TLS. And in fact, we recommend TLS uh, just for security. Now, one troubleshooting tip, if your entity link doesn't seem to be working and you're using TLS, I like to try it as TCP just to see whether the problem is a general networking problem or whether it's specific to TLS, maybe a certificate problem. Uh, the ports on either end, those are the listen ports on those ends. Um, by default, they're going to be 5060 for TCP or 5061 for TLS. You are, of course, free to change that. Um, there's a drop down for IP address family, so uh, whether you want to route IPv4 or IPv6. And the connection policy drop down menu, uh, you really want that to be trusted when you're routing inside your enterprise. Otherwise, SIP requests are going to be challenged and you're going to have to authenticate. So, a common reason that calls fail is the link between the session manager and the, and the communication manager isn't trusted. So, the session manager is challenging communication manager and communication manager doesn't respond with authentication to that. So um, that's one thing to check when uh, calls are failing inside your enterprise. Also, there's a deny new service checkbox. Um, you can use that to take out of service individual entity links. Say you're doing maintenance on your communication manager and you don't want session manager to route calls there. Uh, check the deny new service box and session manager won't be routing calls over this particular entity link. I talked about FQDNs as SIP entity addresses. Um, so there are two ways you can resolve that FQDN. Um, you can resolve it using a real DNS server, uh, just like you would resolve any other FQDN in your data networking. Uh, the address of that DNS server is going to be administered as you install your SM. And then uh, when session manager encounters uh, 
a SIP entity with an FQDN, it can resolve that FQDN to an IP address by contacting your DNS server. Uh, we provide another mechanism for resolving FQDNs, and that is local host name resolution. Uh, this is administered um, on System Manager, and I'll, I'll show you what that screen looks like in a second. Uh, <clears throat> so you can list your FQDNs there and map them to IP addresses. Um, you can map an FQDN to multiple IP addresses um, that's useful for alternate routing or load balancing, for example. Um, LHNR, local host name resolution, takes precedence over real DNS. So if you enter things in LHNR, the actual DNS server won't be consulted. And what you enter in LHNR um, don't have to be real um, FQDNs that your DNS server would recognize. You can make up whatever you want. This is just for SIP routing. So let's take a look at that form. Uh, so here's what I've got in my lab. Um, I've got a bunch of different FQDNs, and you can see that my various FQDNs map into multiple IP addresses. And for each of those addresses, I can also specify a port. Uh, now, you're gonna have multiple ports in play here if you do this. Um, so if my SIP entity resolves into an address with a port on this form, uh, there's also a port on the entity link form. So which port is, is this really going to use? Uh, that depends on a checkbox. Um, the, uh, that checkbox controls whether you're going to use the port on this form or whether you're going to use the port on the entity link, and that's a, a common reason calls fail also. Um, you're, you're not using the port you expected you were using. Um, the priority and the weight, those are going to be used for alternate routing and load balancing. Um, so. If you're routing to a SIP entity and it has multiple addresses and uh, one of them has a numerically lower priority than the other, you're going to route to the lower numbered um, address first. And if that fails, you go to the next highest numbered address. Uh, so that's one way to implement alternate routing. If you have equal priorities, and uh, then the weights come into play. So for equal priorities, calls are distributed randomly according to the weights. So if I have equal weights for the addresses, then equal numbers of calls are going to go to those addresses. Uh, this is not a round robin sort of thing. This is uh, statistical um, load balancing. What that means is if you have two addresses with equal priorities and equal weights, you're not going to see one call go to the first address, then the second call goes to the second address, then the third call goes back to the first address, fourth call goes to the second address, and so on. Instead, each call is going to randomly go to one of the addresses, and over a, a longer period of time, you should see that 50% went to one address and 50% went to the other address. It's not going to be exactly 50% necessarily, but the more calls you make, the closer it should be to 50%. Uh, so let's see, a little more discussion about alternate routing here. There are two kinds of alternate routing we support. There's high-level alternate routing, where you try multiple SIP entities. So if a dial pattern has multiple routing policies associated with it, um, you'll try those routing policies in ascending rank order until one of them succeeds. So this would be a way to try a higher priority SIP entity first, and if that fails, try a lower priority SIP entity. Uh, so you could uh, do alternate routing between multiple SIP entities that way. Low-level alternate routing is going to try multiple IP addresses for a single SIP entity. And you can use both of these for the same call. Uh, so at the high level, you try a SIP entity for that SIP entity. At the low level, you're going to try various addresses for that SIP entity. None of those addresses works, then you're going to move on to the next SIP entity. Um, Low-level alternate routing is going to occur when a SIP entity's FQDN resolves to multiple IP addresses, either uh, from your DNS server or because you added those on LHNR. Uh, as I mentioned, these addresses are tried in priority order uh, based on what you entered on LHNR. If priorities are equal, then it's distributed randomly based on the weight. Um, you would want to use different priorities for alternate routing. When your preferred destination is unavailable, you go to the next destination. An example of that would be if you have a CM with a main and an ESS. Uh, 
you would administer the main with a higher priority and the ESS with lower priority. So calls would try the main CM first. And if the main CM is unavailable, then the call routes to the ESS instead. Uh, you would use the same priority for load balancing among different addresses. So if you have a CM, uh, if, if you have a SIP entity that um, uses IP address takeover for redundancy, so you've got multiple servers using the same IP address, um, you could load balance between those multiple servers. Uh, you could load balance among different addresses for that one that one feature server. Um, using the same priority, but um, then calls get distributed by the weight. Uh, use equal weights if you want everyone to get the same number of calls, but uh, if you wanted to, you could send 90% of the calls to a high capacity server or 10% of the calls to a lower capacity server. Okay, now it's going to get a little more complex. Um, we're going to talk about regular expression routing. So, SIP calls typically route based on digits. But SIP does allow routing alphanumeric request URIs. An example of that would be something like SIP colon helpdesk at avaya.com. Uh, or if you wanted to, you could assign um, you know, URIs with names to all of your users and route them using regular expressions. Uh, it's pretty uncommon to do that. Uh, you would uh, administer this on the regular expression form, and I'll show you a screenshot of that in a second. Uh, if you're not familiar with regular expressions, I've got a couple of examples here. Um, the simplest kind of regular expression is just a plain old string with no meta characters in it. So, for example, helpdesk at avaya.com. Uh, you can use meta characters, wildcards. Um, a dot stands for any character. A plus means one or more of the thing before the plus. A star means zero or more of the thing before the star. So I've got an example here, dot plus at avaya.com. So that means uh, one or more of any character followed by at avaya.com. Uh, actually, something a little bit tricky in this particular regular expression is uh, avaya.com, that dot is actually a wildcard. So something like avaya bcom would also match this. Uh, if you're doing something like this particular regular expression, it's a good practice to put uh, to escape that dot, so put a backslash before it, and then it matches only a dot rather than matching any character. Uh, the final example here is a, a little more complicated and contrived. So um, square brackets, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. The square brackets uh, mean alternation, so pick one of these characters, uh, followed by a plus, meaning one or more of those. So this example is going to be a digit string containing only even numbers followed by at avaya.com. Um, if you read up on regular expressions, um, you can match all sorts of um, patterns. You can create all sorts of interesting effects. Uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, talking more about regular expressions is really beyond the scope of this particular talk. Uh, but if you're interested in regular expression routing and uh, regular expression adaptation, uh, there is a white paper on the Avaya support site that goes into a lot of detail with a lot of examples of this stuff. Uh, one last caveat regarding regular expression routing. Digit routing is much, much more efficient than regular expression routing. So use regular expression routing sparingly. Uh, the example I gave you a second ago about having um, alphanumeric request URIs for all your users so that, for example, people would call me using SIP colon Dennis Sanger at avaya.com. If you have a large number of users, um, like most enterprises would, that's going to be a very inefficient way to route your calls. And uh, you may cause yourself um, performance problems if you have thousands and thousands of regular expressions. We've done performance testing with you know, fairly, um, fairly reasonable numbers of regular expressions up to say a thousand and that performs fairly well uh, beyond that you you do run the risk of degrading your performance uh, the reason for that is that regular expressions are tried in rank order one after the other uh, so for every call you would be going down your list of 1000 regular expressions trying one after the other till you find one that matches 
It's not a very efficient way to route calls. Digit routing is much, much more efficient than that. Uh, this is what the regular expression form looks like. So you enter your pattern. Uh, much like a dial pattern, you can restrict it by location or origination dial pattern set. Uh, then at the bottom, you add one or more routing policies. So if this regular expression matches, you're going to try these routing policies. Um, the condition is uh, is a very powerful uh, thing you can do with regular expression routing. Um, we've got an example on the next page. Um, so uh, again, a fairly contrived example, but it does show you the power of this, and maybe you can come up with examples that are useful to you in your enterprise. Uh, so what I've got here in is, is an example of how you would match uh, SIP invite requests that involve Android endpoints using H2 64 video. It's a, a very specific sort of call. Uh, on the condition form, you've got two operands that you can tie together with an AND or an OR. Uh, each operand specifies part of the SIP invite. So when one session manager sees an incoming SIP invite, it's going to match the various headers against these operands. You don't have to specify two operands, you can specify just one. And in fact, you can chain conditions together. Uh, so rather than this example, I could have um, condition one and condition two makes up condition three. And then condition three and condition four, that's condition five. And you can chain these together to an arbitrary depth to create very, very complicated effects. This example, um, my operand one is going to look at the user agent header in the SIP invite. Uh, typically, the user agent is populated by the endpoint with what kind of endpoint it is. So my expression is Android. If I see the, the character string Android in the user agent header, I know that it's coming from an Android endpoint. Second operand is uh, application SDP. SDP specifies what kind of media you want to use um, for this call. So if the Android endpoint that sent this invite wants to do H.264 video, it's going to match this second operand, and I can route the call differently than I would otherwise. So all my Android H.264 calls get routed one direction. All my other calls get routed a different direction. It's a, a very powerful concept. You can create some, some very complicated effects this way. Okay, back to the regular expression routing. So in addition to restricting this regular expression to a location or an origination dial pattern set or both, uh, I can put conditions on it. So this regular expression only applies if that condition is met. Uh, rank order, um, like I said, you, you're going to walk through your various regular expressions in rank order. So you're going to try them one after another. You have to specify rank. Uh, so that's regular expression routing. Uh, OK, so now we're going to change gears a little bit to adaptation. <clears throat> so those were all the routing capabilities. Uh, adaptation isn't exactly a routing capability. We have two kinds of adaptation. We've got uh, digit adaptation and we've got regular expression adaptation. Digit adaptation has been around since day one. Uh, regular expression adaptation is a newer capability added in 8.0.1. Uh, so digit adaptation is the kind of thing um, you're used to from communication manager. It's, it's supported that for decades now. You want to modify digit strings. Uh, say you have um, a short digit string within your enterprise, and then when you want to route to the outside world, you've got to go, um, if you're in the U.S., you go to a full 10 digits, for example, or around the world, you go to varying numbers of digits. Uh, you would use digit adaptation to do that kind of modification. So you've got an invite coming into Session Manager. Uh, it has your private four-digit numbering plan or seven-digit numbering plan or however many digits you use within your enterprise. Um, then you can insert or delete digits um, and map it to the digits you want to send to your service provider instead. Uh, the way this works is you specify a digit pattern, which, much like dial patterns, is going to be leading digits and a minimum and a maximum number of digits. We'll take a look at a screenshot in a second. Uh, then you specify digits you want to insert or how many digits you want to delete from the beginning of the digit string. Uh, this can happen 
on ingress to SM, so on SIP invites coming into SM, or on egress from SM when SM sends the SIP invite to a, another SIP entity. Um, so you can convert you know, calls coming from a service provider from the outside full number to your internal dial plan, and then when you route out to a, a, a different service provider, you could go back to the outside number of digits um, from your internal dial plan. Uh, in addition to just modifying digit strings, um, digit adaptation is useful for modifying SIP messages to accommodate various vendors' different dialects of SIP. Uh, SIP is a bit of a vague um, communications protocol. Uh, it's, it's a framework, really, and there are a lot of things that are left open. Uh, so different vendors interpret SIP in different ways. And um, in general, vendors try to be very open about accommodating things that are different than what they use. Uh, but sometimes you encounter um, you encounter vendors that are very particular about particular uh, SIP headers. And um, calls aren't going to work if you don't conform to what that vendor wants. This is where these various digit adapters come in. So if you're routing calls from your session manager to AT&T, for example, um, there are certain things that AT&T requires uh, that maybe aren't in the invite that you're trying to send to AT&T. And the exact differences between the vendors are, are beyond the scope of this particular talk. Uh, they're, they're very specific things. But we do have um, digit adapters that will do these modifications uh, to accommodate the different dialects for the different vendors. Uh, we've got adapters for AT&T, Cisco, Nortel, Orange, and Verizon. Um, so in addition to doing digit adaptation, these, yeah, and, and the digit adaptation it has the full flexibility that you would get just with the plain old digit adapter. Uh, in addition to doing digit adaptation, then you'll also do the protocol adaptation for these vendors. Um, once you've created an adapter, then you can apply it to one or more SIP entities on the SIP entity form. So let's take a look at an example adaptation. Uh, kind of a silly example, but it gives you a flavor for what you can do here. Uh, the most important part is specifying the module name. So the adaptation name is just an arbitrary string. The module name is the kind of adapter you're going to be using here. Uh, this is just the plain old digit con uh, conversion adapter. From the drop-down menu, I could have chosen, for example, the AT&T adapter. I'd still have the full digit conversion capabilities, and then under the covers, session manager would be making the changes that AT&T wants to see. This particular example is called Everything Routes to 303538111. And what this does, um, for incoming calls to SM, you see the matching pattern is star. Uh, now, I got to point out that on the adaptation form, these are not regular expressions. Um, star is not a valid regular expression. Instead, this works like dial pattern. Uh, well, not really like dial patterns either. But, uh, um, well, actually, I'm not sure this is even valid. Um, this is a sort of a malformed example. This should be an X instead of a star. A uh, star is actually a valid digit, so sorry about that. Uh, so if I had an X there, uh, minimum and maximum five, that would mean any digit followed by four more digits, uh, what I'm going to do with this is delete five digits and then insert 303538111. So the effect of this is I see a five-digit number come in and I change it to 303538111. So all my calls are going to route to that number. Uh, like I said, a silly example, but it gives you a flavor for what you can do with this. Likewise, you can do digit conversion on outgoing calls. So um, I've got my internal five-digit number. I want to uh, prepend area code, for example, uh, before I send it to a service provider. I would do that with digit conversion on outgoing calls. Regular expression adaptation, uh, a newer feature introduced in 801. Uh, this lets you modify more than just digit strings. You can modify pretty much any part of a SIP message using regular expression adaptation. So you can change various URIs. Um, in ways far beyond just inserting and deleting digits. Uh, you can insert, delete, and modify SIP headers. Uh, so rather than using the, uh, the vendor-specific adaptations that we've provided, if you, um, 
if you have a different service provider than one of the ones that we've already provided an adaptation for, uh, you don't have to wait for us to develop an adapter. You don't have to go to professional services and get them to uh, develop a custom adapter. You can do your own adaptation by uh, modifying whatever SIP header it is that offends your service provider. Um, so let's take a look at an example of that. And at this point, I'm going to go very quickly because um, regular expression adaptation is a topic for at least an hour long talk, probably more. And the examples get very, very involved. Uh, but I just want to give you an idea of the sorts of things you could do with regular expression adaptation. And uh, like I said, there is a white paper on the support site <clears throat> that goes into a lot of detail on regular expression adaptation. Uh, so here's a, a real world example. Um, there's an, an alternate CLI feature on CM. Uh, CLI is calling line identification. So CM populates a SIP header called alternate CLI. And when SM gets it, what you want is to use that alternate CLI. This is an outgoing call center kind of feature. Uh, you want to use that alternate CLI as the calling number uh, when you send this call to your service provider for, for outbound call center sort of calls. Uh, so there's an incoming adaptation rule. This, this is incoming to CM, uh, to SM, sorry. So from CM to SM, this would be an incoming adaptation from SM's point of view. Uh, you can have multiple rules. Each rule is going to have one or more actions. Uh, you can put conditions on these rules. And these conditions are the same as for regular expression routing. So you can come up with very complicated conditions. Uh, I'm not going to show you this particular condition. It's a, a pretty simple condition that just looks for the string wealth management in the display name. Uh, so if you see display name wealth management in your SIP invite, then you're going to follow this rule. Let me show you what the rule looks like. Uh, this is a pretty complicated rule. We're not going to go through it in, in painful detail. Uh, basically, the rule has the condition wealth management. It's an incoming rule. It's the first rule in this particular adaptation. So you order the rules, um, and they execute in that order. In a rule, you're going to have a collection of actions, and those actions can use variables that you define. So you can read parts of SIP headers into these variables and then use those variables to create new SIP headers or to modify existing SIP headers. In this case, what this rule is going to do is it's going to delete the alternate CLI header, and then it's going to modify the passerted identity header to insert the contents of that alternate CLI header into it. Uh, again, I'm going through this very quickly because to do justice to this example would take probably an hour all by itself. Uh, so final topic before we go to questions. Um, troubleshooting tools, a couple of tools for figuring out why your call didn't route the way you think it should have routed. Uh, first, there's the call routing test. Uh, this has been around for a long time, but recently um, we've gone to some effort to make it a little easier to use. Um, in the past, it was pretty esoteric, pretty, um, pretty complicated to use. Uh, so we've made some usability enhancements here. Uh, the way this works is you enter the relevant parameters um, to specify what an incoming invite would look like, and then session manager pretends it got that invite, pretends to route that invite, and lets you know where it would have routed that invite and why it would have routed it there. Things you have to enter are the IP address you, you would be calling from, that's used for location determination. Um, the calling party URI, basically the, the number of the person calling, and the call-ed party URI, that's the destination for the call. Um, day of the week and time, um, you need to enter that because of the effects of time of day routing. Uh, that is pre-populated with the current day and time, um, just in case you don't care about time of day routing. But if it's you know the middle of your workday and you're trying to troubleshoot why calls don't route correctly at night, you don't actually have to come in at night and make real calls. You can use this to simulate calls made at a different time. Uh, you have to specify which session manager you want to do this test on. Um, uh, transport pro protocol and session manager listen port are also important uh, for session manager to determine which entity link this invite is coming in on. Uh, and then 
down bottom, there is a, a text box where you can enter arbitrary SIP headers. Uh, so if you're doing complicated routing based on SIP headers, uh, this would apply to regular expression routing, for example, or it would apply to regular expression adaptation. Uh, you enter those headers in the SIP headers box. Uh, if you click on the attachment tab, you can also enter things like SDP. Uh, that would be a, a pretty advanced way to try to route if you're routing based on contents of SDP. That's like that Android uh, video example I showed you a little bit ago. So enter arbitrary SIP headers or arbitrary SDP in that text box, and then click on execute and session manager will pretend to route your invite and then give you feedback about what would have happened. And that looks like this. So routing decisions is just a one line summary of where this invite would have wound up going. So um, my request URI SIP colon 57777 at via.com would have routed to the SIP entity SIP P2 and the terminating location is Thornton. Just a one line summary of where this would have gone. And then you've got multiple pages of information about why it would have gone there. Uh, so if you've got something administered not the way you expected, this is where you would see what happened. So uh, things like what SIP entity did session manager believe this invite was coming from? If that's different than you expected, then maybe you should check the ports on your entity links, um, for example. Um, adaptations. So the first thing that happens when the invite comes into Session Manager is it tries to do incoming adaptation. In this case, there's no incoming adaptation administered, but you would see the effect of the adaptation in this routing uh, decision process. And then it goes on through the dial patterns, all the different combinations of dial patterns it tried. Uh, it tells you which one it found that matched and uh, on and on like that. So um, I find that very useful for troubleshooting uh, misadministration without actually having to place calls. Uh, this is also useful if you have multiple locations and it's only users in one location, which happens to be far away from your own location where calls aren't working. Uh, you can use this to test out calls from any of your locations. Uh, the second troubleshooting tool I want to mention is Trace SM. This is a command line tool on the session manager. It traces SIP messages in and out of SM in real time. So you see the messages as they're received and sent. Uh, it's runnable as cust and craft. Uh, of course, it's also runnable as root, but most customers don't have access to that. Just type trace SM, capitalization is very important, um, from the Linux command line interface. And um, so you see a list of messages as they come and go. You can click on, well, not really click, but you can highlight and then hit enter. Uh, on any one of those messages and you see the complete contents of that message. Um, also very useful for troubleshooting routing problems. Uh, I would advise you to use this with care because it can cause performance problems if you're using it on a system with high traffic. Uh, so using it in a lab is no problem at all. Using, uh, using it um, during a light traffic period also should be no problem, but if you've got a call center with like 100,000 calls an hour, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using this, uh, certainly not during your busy period. Uh, okay, so that is all I've got. We can move on to questions. So let's take a look at some questions. Uh, depending on the number of questions, I don't anticipate we're gonna get to all of them. Uh, bear with me while I scroll to the top of the questions. Okay, I'm seeing some questions about audio. Um, we're going to scroll past those. Okay, here's one about rank. Uh, so we can use rank 100 if need to use time range of rank 100. Uh, the rank is administered on the routing policy. Let's go back to the routing policy. Okay, so here we are at the routing policy. So this 
this rank is administered on the routing policy. So what this is is a mapping of time of day to rank for this specific routing policy. So every routing policy you're gonna administer uh, maybe a different rank here, maybe the same rank, maybe a different rank. So you could have another routing policy that goes to a different destination that has these exact same times of day and the ranks are different. So maybe during business hours, this one has rank one and a different one has rank two, you're gonna prefer this one. And then on the weekend, this one has rank 100, the other routing policy is rank one, so you're gonna prefer the other one. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Okay, we've got a question about TLS. If you choose TLS, do you need to request certificates to be set up, uh, CSR raised and signed by your CA? Yes, absolutely. Um, we provide demo certificates um, with Session Manager. You can use those demo certificates, but um, they're the same for every session manager in the world, so that's not very secure. You are going to want to um, use your own certificates. You can generate um, certificates from S Manager, and those will be specific to you. So, I mean, that's that's secure enough. Or you can uh, you can get certificates from one of the certificate providers. You don't have to use the S Manager generated certificates. On to the next question. Okay, CM entity is administered with FQDN via cm.fbfs.com. It's not DNS resolvable, sure. Uh, on the session manager and system manager, it looks like it resolves the IP addresses of the CM and ESS. That is what I would expect. So that is configured locally in the system manager, yes. That would be on the local host name resolution form. So on local hostname resolution, you specify the FQDN and map it to the IP address of your main CM and the IP address of your ESS, uh, and give your main CM uh, higher priority, where higher means numerically lower. The ESS gets the lower priority or numerically higher. Uh, so yes, that is administered on your local hostname resolution form. Okay, another question. Uh, this is a question about sending out the PowerPoint. That's more a question for Paige. I'm going to assume that the presentation will be available to everyone. Okay, regular expression engine um, for regular expression routing and for regular expression adaptation. Uh, that would be the Java regular expression engine. Now, <clears throat> at a high level, um, it doesn't matter so much which regular expression engine you're using. Uh, because they're broadly compatible. But uh, when you're using more advanced features of regular expressions, there are some differences between the various regular expressions. Perl, for example, is different in very specific ways than um, Java. So if you're looking for a regular expression reference to use with Session Manager, you would go to the Java re regular expression reference page. Uh, but for simple applications, it's, it's really not gonna matter. Okay, next question. Uh, which release do these tips apply to? The screenshots I'm using are all from 8.1.3, but many of these screens haven't changed in probably a decade. Um, so uh, most of what I'm talking about would apply if you were on you know, even 6.1, for example. Uh, but some of uh, some of the features I'm talking about are, are relatively new, like, for example, um, regular expression adaptation is an 8.0.1 feature. Um, so it really does vary um, depending on feature. But uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is, is applicable to older releases as well. Uh, are there Avaya products other than Media Server that require the use of regex? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what require means in this context. Um, you can certainly set up your session manager and never even worry about regular expressions. And uh, you can set up a session manager to work with communication manager and voicemail and all sorts of other things and 
never even think about regular expressions. Uh, the regular expression capabilities of Session Manager are really there for more advanced applications. Um, I don't have, you know, simple generic uh, examples of things you can do only with regular expressions and not with dial patterns. The examples get complicated very quickly, and there are a lot of those examples in the white paper. Okay, so let's do a few more questions and then we're going to be out of time. And again, I'm going to try to answer these questions in writing and have those answers distributed to uh, all the participants. Uh, the Android endpoint, referring to the CU360, no, that was a, a more generic example. I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, it, it wasn't a real world example. I was talking about um, using a soft phone like um, Avaya IX Workplace on an Android endpoint. Uh, when you place a call from that application, then your user agent header is gonna claim to be an Android endpoint. Um, um, it really was just an example. I, I wasn't specifically thinking of the CU360. Is there a limit to how many regular expression adaptations you can use? Capacities is, is a really interesting topic for session manager in general. Uh, we generally publish capacities, um, but we don't necessarily hold you to those capacities, meaning um, we'll say you can administer, it's an absurdly large number, like 10,000, I think, uh, 10,000 SIP entities. Uh, will you be prevented from administering the 10,000 and first? No, you won't. Uh, will bad things happen when you do that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the capacities are really more what we've tested to, what we guarantee will work. And if you go beyond those capacities, you may have unpredictable results. And that's true for regular expression adaptations as well. Um, but that does remind me actually of something I didn't mention. And that is as of 8.0.1, you can chain adaptations for SIP entities. Previously, you could have exactly one adaptation for your SIP entity. As of 8.0.1, you can chain together adaptations. And uh, we don't really have a limit on the number you can use. But uh, but again, uh, there's a published capacity, and I, I don't recall off the top of my head what that is, but it's pretty large. Uh, I don't think for normal use you're going to run into that limit. Uh, okay, I'm willing to answer questions for a couple more minutes. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Is there a performance hit or a reason to not enable some of the regular expression routing adaptations? There is a performance impact, absolutely. Uh, and it depends on how heavily you're using the regular expression adaptations and how elaborate your regular expression adaptation is. Uh, we've tested what we think is a, a pretty severe number of regular expression adaptations and the performance impact is not that bad. So um, putting together an adaptation with a lot of conditions and a lot of header modifications and running a lot of traffic you know, we see like a 10% CPU hit. And you really can't hold me to that number because it's very, very specific to your exact configuration. Uh, but running quite a bit of traffic with a very elaborate adaptation, you do see an effect, but it's not a severe effect. Um, if you administer more and more and more regular expression adaptations, you may at some point run into performance problems. You're gonna have to monitor that very carefully. But uh, this is not one of those cases where we can give you a, a one-size-fits-all sort of answer. It really depends on what you're doing. Uh, but yes, there is performance impact, and you need to be aware of that and carefully watch for that. Uh, digit con in Digit Conversion Adapter, what is Address to Modify? Uh, the Address to Modify is either incoming or outgoing, or both, actually. Uh, so. <clears throat> Um, incoming, you know, for an incoming SIP invite, incoming addresses, uh, for example, would be uh, the from header or the P asserted identity header. Outgoing would be your request URI or your to header. Okay, and one last question before we wrap up. Uh, can the call routing test be used from SBC registered phones? Um, to be clear, the call routing test is something you do on, on system manager, so it's not like you're using it from SBC registered phones, but what I assume the question intended was, can I use the call routing test on, um, on S manager 
to simulate a call from an SBC phone. And yes, you can. Uh, you just have to fill out the, uh, the various fields such that it looks exactly like an invite from your SBC registered phone. So you could use a tool like TraceSM, for example, to, um, to see what that invite would generally look. Um, there are some, some SBC specific parameters that are inserted. Um, so all, all phones behind an SBC are gonna look like they come from the same IP address, but there are other parameters on the request URI, or um, on the, the, the from rather, uh, that are gonna tell you which endpoint it's really coming from. So yes, you can use it, but it's, it's more complicated than doing it from internal phones. Uh, Okay, last question. Uh, in 813, there's a new option to have adaptation for devices. Um, actually, that's 812. So you've got it, it's definitely in 813, but uh, it first came in in 812. Uh, we have a regular issue where third party devices don't present the domain correctly so that SM recognizes the device wants to register. Would that be a solution to correct the incorrect domain? Uh, yes and no. Um, we apply device adaptation. So um, the 30 second summary of device adaptation. Uh, this is a, a feature that's been available for quite a while, uh, except that it's under the covers, there's no admin for it. Um, and these are adaptations that have been provided by Avaya. So for very specific types of endpoints, we do adaptation under covers. As of 812, we've exposed that on, uh, on system managers so that you can create your own device adaptations. You don't have to wait for us to develop them. Um, so the question is, can you use that to adapt a register request? And unfortunately, no, you can't. Device adaptation applies only after the device has registered. So if you've got a registered device uh, and there are some SIP headers you need to have modified um, because you send an invite to the device and there's something it doesn't recognize and the call doesn't work, uh, you could strip out some headers, for example, before sending the invite to the device. It's a, it's a very powerful capability if you've got third-party SIP endpoints that don't behave the way you expect. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't work on the register request itself because we don't know what kind of device it is until it's registered. Uh, okay, so that's all we have time for. I'm going to turn it back to Paige to wrap up. Great, thank you so much to Dennis from Avaya for taking the time to speak to us today. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing by the end of the day. I will also send out an email to all attendees, including the PowerPoint deck, um, as well as the question and answers after um, we review them. Um, you can find out more about the IUG webinar program by visiting iug.org slash learn. And please make sure to complete that short evaluation that will pop up as you exit. Let us know how today's session went. Otherwise, I hope you all have a great rest of your day.